every one of you who feel like nobody wants to hear what you've got to say, nobody's interested in what you want to do, nobody's interested in your desires, they're not interested in you, they don't value you in any way, shape, or form. God values you. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm going to go further down because I want to get to the point. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift, starting at verse 6. Stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You hear that? A sound mind. Hmm. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but thou partaker of the afflictions. Be thou a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who have saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Lord Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. You know, one of the things that we don't always realize is how well God can keep us. I don't know if you ever watch parents with their kids, but there are times when kids get ready to get rambunctious and the parent knows that the kid is a little too eager beaver, lacking wisdom, but full of zest, full of zeal, <laughs> full of energy and enthusiasm. And there are times when God has to give us wisdom he has to slow our rolls, so to speak. And there are times when others of us have been sitting for so long, God has to put a little fire up under our behinds to get us to, to move into action. So when you deal with a parent with their child and they grab that child, that child is being grabbed not out of anger, Sometimes we feel like we're being held back in life. Sometimes we feel like the doors are shut in our face or there is no uh, there is no support in the direction we're heading. Now, we may be right smack dab in the center of God's will. Now, if you're wondering why I'm looking up and looking down, depending upon which vantage point you're seeing me from is because I have the camera right behind my computer. So in case one dies, I can still depend on my camera of my computer, my webcam. Okay. I'm still learning to work with this system here with, with two camera sources. So what I want you to think about is when, when a parent has a child and that child wants to go running and they're excited, they want to jump, romp and play. There are times when the parent sees dangers, uh, you know, uh, not so much apparent dangers, but possible dangers, because there may be some dogs running loose. There may be too, there may be too much traffic in the street, or too many bikes going back and forth, or too many people, and with a crowded situation, things can happen. And the parent knows all that could happen, so they restrain the child. And the child is at the age where, yeah, they're supposed to play. It's a time to play. They took them there to play. But they have to make sure that the setting is right, that the setting is safe, 
that it's an okay atmosphere for them to let them go free. So there are times in our lives when our parent, our Heavenly Father, restrains us and he pulls us back when we want to barrel forward. And when he pulls us back, he's not rejecting us. He's not binding us. He's not punishing us. Remember that. What he's doing is protecting us and using time that we live in as a form of a covering. There's a, a form of restraint. Everything could not have total freedom at all times. There's a time to release and there's a time to refrain. And we have to remember that God is in control of our lives. So there are times when we want to barrel forward and God is telling us, no, baby, you need a whole lot of healing in that area. And if I let you barrel forward, you're going to do more damage than you will good. That doesn't mean God's not pleased with you. It doesn't mean God's not happy with you. It means that God is our compassionate, understanding, patient father that knows our inward workings. He understands that we need more work in this area or that area. So what does he do? He restrains us. He holds us back. Because in some areas, we are very ready. And in other areas, we are not. There are times when some of you, you think of yourself as knowing certain things or having a certain level of understanding. Now, I'm going to share this about me so that you'll see my point without taking offense at what I'm saying about you. In some areas, I have a lot of insight. I can see way below the surface. I can really dissect and decipher and, and discern. I can really pick up on stuff. I can read people's body language. I can read their, their, their facial expressions. I can read a lot of things what people aren't saying. I can tell a lot of times when people are happy, when they're not happy, when they're offended, when they're not offended. Well, I can tell by the tone of voice if they don't want to be bothered. I, I can tell. Now, in other areas, if you were to ask me what did Sister Appleseed wear or what did Brother Pumpkinhead wear yesterday or last week, I couldn't tell you probably. Not, I would remember what the hair looked like because I'm into hair. But I would not remember the details of what they wore. Why? That's not something I zero in on. I couldn't tell you what the shoes look like. I couldn't, I, you know, unless the outfit really struck me as being beautiful, I'm not going to notice it that much. So, for example, Peter and I spent the whole day together on the 4th of July. I couldn't tell you what he wore unless I looked at the video again because I'm not hung up on what people wear. But I do like pretty clothes. Now, if he was wearing a tuxedo and he was all dressed to the nine, I would probably remember it more because it would just strike me. But other than that, I'm not going to remember. I remember his hair looked good, but I don't remember what he wore. So I can sit there and talk to Lynn over the phone. And I can always tell when Lynn's ready to end the conversation. I can tell. See, there are things that we pick up on and things that we don't. So my point in saying that is there are things that will go right over my head. I'll miss it, but you might catch it. So there may be some things I think I'm ready for. I'm ready to tango. I'm ready to go out on the dance floor and get it on. And God is telling me, no, you're not. You're going to trip over your own two feet and you're going to trip the other people on the dance floor too because you're not ready. One of the hardest things for us to recognize from God is when we're ready and when we're not ready, when we are fully equipped and when we're only partially equipped. And some of us want to go out and do battle and we don't even have, we don't even know how to use our weapons. We don't know how to clean a gun, sharpen our sword, 
I mean, we don't know how to do any of it. But we want to go out to war because we want to fight the good fight. Well, sometimes God is saying no because you're going to get beat up. It's not time for you to fight. First, I need to teach you some tactical maneuvers, defense maneuvers. I have to teach you how to war. I have to teach you how to break a bow of steel with your bare hands. I have to teach you leverage so that you depend more on my leverage than you do on your strength. I have to teach you wisdom so that you lean on my wisdom more than you do your intellect. I have to teach you timing. <laughs> I mean, see, God calls us to a particular purpose. He calls us to do certain things when you know, when we're ready to be used on this planet for him, for his kingdom. But there are certain things that life has to teach us. And God will use the vicissitudes of life, the demonic realm. He will use obstacles, delays, interferences, and distractions. And he's not going to tempt us. But the temptations that come our way, he will use as a teaching mechanism, as eye openers. And a lot of times, see, God is preparing us not only for battle. He's preparing us to be used. He, first thing we must do is get ourselves together. And we can't do that by ourselves. We need the power of the Holy Ghost. We need God's love, his insight. We need his help. We need his power. We, we need everything he has to offer to help us get a grip. And once we know who we are, we know as the more we get to know ourselves, the more we get to know our strengths and the more we get to understand our weaknesses. Now, don't sit there and be mad because you got areas in your life where you're weak. Because let me tell you, baby, there are certain things in life that are extremely, extremely strong. But if you get them right at the right spot, everything has a vulnerable spot. And if you get them at the right spot, it'll fold. So no matter how strong, no matter how, how, um, I'm trying to think of what to say. What I'm trying to say in all this is a lot of you see yourselves as strong Christians, strong adults. You, you're grown, you've learned, you've lived this life, you're strong. You've gained a lot along the way. But what God is trying to show you and me is that we are not as strong and together as we think we are. Hmm. But God is able to keep us. In spite of all of our weaknesses, God is able to keep us. So no matter what, when you go through life, the one to depend on is God, not yourself. God's word, not your lip. They don't need to hear your lip. They need to hear God's word, God's principles, God's statutes, not your attitude. What God is doing is developing us. He's strengthening us. He's growing us. And sometimes some of the basics in life are still happening down the road for us. We think we've grown there. We think we have arrived in this area. We think we're good there. We think we have arrived in that area. And God is telling us, no, baby, if I lift my Holy Spirit, you're just as messed up as you were 10 years before you ever thought of knowing me. It's the Holy Spirit, y'all the hope of glory that's working in us, that takes us beyond our own limits. So what I ask you to do is call on God at every given moment. Call on him for ideas. Call on him for wisdom. Call on him for knowledge. Call on him for strength. 
Call on him for endurance. Call on him for power. Call on him for authority. Call on him for every word that's to come out of your mouth. Whether at work, at the bank, at the gym, or at home. No matter where you are, you need to be a vessel of honor. People ought to know when they see you, when they hear you, when they're around you, there's something different about this one. Did you notice that? There's something different. Hmm. I'm trying to figure out what it is, but it's something really good about this person. They don't know they're seeing God in you, the hope of glory. They don't know that. Hmm. Help me with this message, Lord. What I'm trying to say, I think, is that God is honing you to be the vessel he wants you to be so that he can use you the way he wants to use you. Allow yourself the freedom to be human, not to revel in sin. I'm not saying that. But allow yourself the freedom to be human. Because number one, I don't care how I don't care what a, a monumental vessel of power that you are supposed to be used as. When you're a baby, baby cakes, you got to crawl before you walk, no matter what. No matter what, you got to crawl before you walk. So the bottom line is, you're going through stages of development. Some of you are insecure. Some of you don't like your own looks. Some of you don't think much of yourselves. Hmm. Some of you are like doubting Thomases, but you're not doubting Jesus or everybody else. You're doubting yourself. Some of you just don't believe in you. You believe in God, but not in yourself. Some of you don't even like, let alone love yourselves. So what I'm trying to say to you is no matter what, lean on God. I'm having a hard time with this message. I thought I was going one direction and last minute a whole different one, so I'm winging it. Lean on God, you guys, please. Because, see, God is developing you through your failures, through your successes, through your trials, through your, your victories. He is building you up. That's why Jesus was a carpenter. That's why his father, Joseph, was a carpenter. You hear me? That's why he was a carpenter. Think about it. What do carpenters do? Build, refurbish? Okay. <sighs> I'm going to read Isaiah 61. God, help me with this. Isaiah 61. I'm going to make it short. I'm not going to make it long. Now, this is what Jesus read in Luke chapter 4 when he announced the description of his ministry. And I want you to hear what he is called to do in us so that you will see what to expect as you walk with Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Now listen to that. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Some of y'all are so broken, you're in fragments. Hmm. And you see Jesus as the savior of your soul, but you don't see him as the healer of your broken heart. And that's why some of you can't do a lot of the things you would do is because you're too broken. You need healing and you're not going to Jesus for your healing. You're trying to hang 
and, and do pain management. You're trying to handle it yourself. Hmm. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives. Some of y'all are bound, y'all. I mean, you're just bound up, tied up in knots. And you need to be set free. And the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Verse 2. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. You know how God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Yeah, some of y'all too busy doing your own vengeance. And then you wonder why things go from bad to worse. To comfort all that mourn. You know, many of you are still mourning things that happened when you were kids. Things that died in you. Dreams that died. Things that people destroyed in your heart. And you're still in mourning because you've never been healed. I'm telling you, there is not one wound God can't heal. See, that's why you need, I keep emphasizing this. Because before you can go off and run a marathon, your, your whole body has to be in good health. It has to be conditioned. What is God doing? He's conditioning us. Every step of the way. Okay, let me go back to mourning. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion. To give unto them beauty for ashes. What does that mean? You give God your ashes, your crap, your garbage, your wounds, your open runny sores, your stench, your weaknesses. God gives you his beauty and all that's involved with his beauty. Huh. In, in exchange. But it's not overnight. So it happens over time, over life and its vicissitudes. The oil of joy for mourning. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Some of you are so heavy, burdened, heavy laden. Uh, just, just got so much on you. And what did Jesus say to that in the New Testament? Come unto me. Or ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What you doing carrying all that? Jeanette was just talking earlier about why she doesn't want to catch a train to the beach. Talking about, I don't want to carry all this and carry all that. I got to get up and down, and we got to walk blocks. And I, yeah, well, see, here, here's what it is with Jesus. Jesus, Jesus would say, I put you on the train, but I carry the load. And I'll get you a ride to where you got to go. So it's not on you to get there. You see what I'm saying? Listen, listen. You don't have to do this on your own. You don't have to carry all those burdens of guilt. Guilt is not of God. Regret and all, oh my goodness, I'm telling you. When God heals you, there's no more regret. You just learn from it, but there's no more guilt. There's no more regret. So that heaviness is gone. And people will not have the power over you to manipulate you into guilt trips either. Okay. Let me find my space here. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And that, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And this is what he does. And they shall build the old waste. There are places in your life that have been crumbled. I mean, they're in ashes, they're crumbs, they're useless, they're worthless. God can resurrect all of it, y'all. I remember years ago when I was a little kid, I used to try to draw pictures. And one of those negative things my mother spoke over me was, Patty, you don't have an eye for perspective, so you'll never be an artist. So I gave up trying to draw. When I was 20, 
almost 27 years old, right after I started going back to church or going to church. I never went, so going to church right before I got saved. I felt this nudging in me because I was now starting to seek God. I felt this nudging in me to go into an old box of pastels and pull out the box of pastels with my mother's old art stuff. And I pulled a picture of a guy with where the sun was setting on his face. It was just a beautiful shot. And I sat there and I drew the picture. And when I got through drawing the picture, I walked over to my mother's place and I held it up from a distance. And she said, what's that, Patty, a photograph of somebody? I knew then I sealed the deal. I knew it. What I'm trying to tell you is people may destroy your hopes. Your dreams may be dashed. Your, your self-confidence may be destroyed or belittled to the point where it's not even worth picking up in your mind's eye. But when God gets through with you, baby cakes, he'll resurrect whatever he chooses. Just go with it. Go with it. Don't say, oh, well, it didn't work before, so I'm not going to try it again. Go with it. You'll be shocked what God can do in you. Hmm. Okay. Now you go on my playlist, you see some of my artwork, you'll see. I got the eye for perspective. Where did I get it? I got it from God. So just because I didn't have it when I was six years old, didn't mean I wasn't going to have it when I was 26. Don't let people dash your dreams. All right. They shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. You know, I'm stopping here. There are times when it feels like we're, we're endowed, over-endowed, we're over-inundated with generational curses, with verbal curses from our mama, our papa, our uncle, our, our, our aunt, our, people, our enemies. They have cursed us to death, and we feel like there's just no use in trying. Nobody believes in me. Nobody's listening to me. Nobody cares about what I have to say. Guess what? God does. I don't care if you talk to a thousand people. I'm going to tell you right now, I feel like I'm, I'm hearing a name in my mind, and I believe this is for Lynn. I don't care who doesn't want to hear what you got to say, Lynn. God wants to hear it. You do not shut your mouth because they don't want to hear it. You open your mouth because God wants to hear you say it. And that's all it counts. That's for every one of you who feel like nobody wants to hear what you've got to say. Nobody's interested in what you want to do. Nobody's interested in your desires. They're not interested in you. They don't value you in any way, shape, or form. God values you. No matter what anybody's opinion of you is, it does not count. If God be for you, who can be against you? Nobody counts. Remember that. Whatever you want to do for God, you go for it. Whatever God wants you to do for yourself, you go for it. You don't worry about what the naysayers say. The naysayers don't count. All right. Now I just got to blowing your eardrums off. I want you to be encouraged because God wants you to be encouraged. And I'm going to read this scripture one more time. I'm closing with the scripture. This is the end of the message. Oh, my goodness, Father. Mm, mm, mm. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love, and of a sound mind. Amen? That's verse 6 of Second of Second Timothy chapter 1. And I got one more that I want to read in the same chapter, if I can just find it. Give me a minute. And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. And I'm ending with that. 
He's able to keep you. He's able to get you there. He's able to build you. He's able to heal you. He's able to prepare you. He's able to equip you. He's able to anoint you. He's able to use you. And he's able to resurrect whatever you think is dead in you. God bless you. Be encouraged. Mm -hmm.